Hi, welcome to Constitutional Chats, hosted by me, Janine Turner, and Kathy Gillespie, with students, Dakari Chapman, and me, Tova Kaplan. Join us as we discuss hot topic issues with constitutional experts. It's sponsored by Constituting America. Constitutional Chats, sponsored by Constituting America, and we're thrilled you're with us today. We are talking about executive orders, which is on everybody's mind. Um, it's going to be a fantastic show. Our special guest is Todd Gaziano. I love saying it with an Italian accent, Gaziano, um, and we're thrilled that he's with us today. So come on in. I'm going to introduce our, our host, the co-host of the show. By the way, I don't know if I said I'm Janine Turner. I'm the founder and co-president of Constituting America. And our show is how executive orders affect your life and our checks and balances. That's the key thing, the checks and balances. And uh, Todd Gaziano is from the Pacific Legal Foundation. I'm going to talk a little bit more about him in two secs. So we're thrilled you're with us. I, uh, once again, I'm founder and co-president of Constituting America. And I'm going to thank our very special sponsors today. And I hope she's watching. Uh, they are watching Paul and Barbara Claffey. I've known Paul and Barbara Claffey for years. They are just extraordinary people. <laughs> extraordinary people. They're extraordinary people. They are heart of gold, great grace, great dignity, great humanitarians, great Americans. And we're thrilled that you have donated your your money to sponsor this show today but also i know you're always a part of our show so we thank you for for donating your your time and your energy and your interest into how to further your participation as american so thank you paul and barbara clappy now i'm going to introduce the rest of the panel here we have kathy gillespie kathy gillespie is co-president of constituting america we like to say in order to fly you need a right wing and a left wing and that's really what Kathy and I are. And by the way, Paul and Barbara Claffey are the wind beneath our wings. That's what we like to say. Our sponsors and our donors are the winds beneath Constituting America's wings. So Kathy is a former chief of staff on the Hill. She's one of the 16 private citizens serving on the U.S. semi-quincentennial, I don't know if it's semi-quincentennial or semi-quincentennial, but nevertheless, semi-quincentennial uh, commission, which they're planning the 200. 50th anniversary of America's founding. So it's going to be fantastic. And what year is that? 2026. She is also the former commissioner on the President's Commission on White House Fellows. I'm just going to move on. Everyone can say hi in a sec. We have Tova Love Kaplan. Tova Love Kaplan is 17 years old. She's a student from Chicago, Illinois. She's a three time winner of our We the Future contest. She's the National Youth Director of Constituting America, which she runs like a top CEO of a of like a CEO of a top 100 company. And she also runs our youth advisory board. She's passionate about inspiring young people to know and use their constitutional rights. Tova is just an extra, I've known what Tova for four years. She, she lights up the room, she steals the room. She never ceases to amaze me. She's simply wonderful. Tova, I'll let you say hi in just two seconds. Then we have Jewel and Jordan Gilbert. They're new to our show. This is their third show. We, they're former winners of our contest as well. Jewel Gilbert is executive producer and Jordan Gilbert is operations director of Sing for America, a family-based company that, that uh, the brothers co-founded. Sing for America seeks to show the art of truth and light through performance. Don't you love that? They're using their gifts for good. Both are proud former We the, Fu we the Future, We the People contest winners. Sing for America, by the way, is an actor-run theater company which specializes in semi-professional musicals, private training in the arts, school drama solutions, and public entertainment events, all while revealing a colorblind world stage. Jewel and Jorn are graduates of the Moravian College, where they each earned a BA in musical performance of dramatic production. Okay, and then Jeanette is our former teacher and PTA president, operations director of Constituting America, and she handles all of the outreaches for school. If you'd like us to book a speech into your school, she can talk about that. 
opportunity. So hello, everyone. Usually I let everyone say hello, but I thought I'll just get all this out of the way, except for our guest star today. I'm going to let y'all say hi and then introduce our special guest, Todd. Okay, so everyone just kind of want to say hello, like the Brady Bunch? <laughs> hello. <laughs> hello. Hello. Nice to see you. Happy to see everyone. Hi, everybody. Hi, everyone. Welcome, Todd. Excited for the show. Yeah, that was like the Brady Bunch, wasn't it? Or, or uh, good night, was it uh, the Waltons? Good night, John. Wasn't that what they said? Good night, John Boy? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Anyway, so we're here. We're having fun. All right, I'm going to introduce our special guest now. Our special guest, here we go. Are you ready, ladies and gentlemen? Drum roll, please. It's Todd Gaziano. He's the Pacific Legal Foundation's Chief of Strategic Research and Legal Policy. I got it. And Director of the, its Center for Separation of Powers. Todd has served in all three branches of the federal government, worked in the private sector, and is a well-known scholar and leader in the Liberty Legal Movement. Oh, I like that. Liberty Legal Movement. Don't y'all like that? Liberty Legal Movement? Todd attended the University of Chicago Law School, where he was a John M. Olin Fellow in Law and Economics. Gotta get that economics in there. His public law work includes service as a law clerk for the U.S. Fifth Circuit Judge Edith Jones, in the US DOJ's Office of Legal Counsel, as the Chief Subcommittee Counsel in the US House of Representatives, and as the founding director of the Heritage Foundation's Legal Center. Wow, that's amazing. Todd has been a frequent legal commentator in print on radio and TV before con congressional committees. I'd love to do that once. And in other public settings, several of his scholarly articles have influenced landmark Supreme Court litigation congressional policy and presidential actions. Todd and his wife, she's also a practicing attorney, reside in Northern Virginia and are proud of their liberty-minded daughter. I think that's a new cool word to, to uh, yeah. Uh, who graduated from Antonin Scalia Law School in 2020 to continue the family trade. Welcome, Todd Gaziano. All right, so welcome, Todd. I know we're gonna talk about executive orders today. We're all very, very curious about this. I know that everyone's also very curious about where this is in the United States Constitution. So you're on to give us a brief summary and then we will pepper you with questions. That is fantastic. First of all, I'm very pleased and honored uh, to join Constituting America for this constitutional chat on presidential executive orders and related documents like executive orders. I hope my opening isn't too boring because the subject and the examples are really exciting, but I've got to get that out of the way. So the first thing I'm going to do is explain what an executive order is. And it's one type of a written presidential directive. Um, and a written presidential directive is simply a written order, instruction, or proclamation by the president to others. Now, there are as many as 27 different varieties uh, but the differences between them aren't really important. I'm going to concentrate, though, on the two most common and historic that were both created by President George Washington and have been used ever since. And the first type is the executive order. So an executive order is an order that the president gives normally to people who report to him in the executive branch. And it's an instruction on how the president wants people in the executive branch to um, follow the law. The second common type of uh, executive directive is a presidential proclamation. And that's usually issued to a broader audience than just his staff. And uh, the first example of a proclamation was George Washington's proclamation of Thanksgiving, uh, urging Americans to give thanks. Um, another important proclamation in our history is Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation issued during the Civil War, and that led to the freedom of millions of slaves in the states that were then still uh, in Civil War. So with that um, a part out of the way, the next question is, is, what is the authority for the president to issue executive orders or proclamations? Well, he's got various types of authority to do so. The Constitution provides him some of that authority because the first sentence of the Constitution gives him all of the executive power and executives issue orders. And written orders are what executive orders are. 
There are other clauses in the Constitution, though, that give him other powers. Their commander in chief clause makes him commander in chief of the armed forces and commanders give commands. So the president generally gives a command to generals and admirals who then give further commands to others. And then there are other clauses of the Constitution. Uh, one is to take care that the laws are faithfully executed. So that's also in Article 2, Section 3. Uh, Congress passes lots of laws and gives the president additional authority. And the president, who's responsible to take care that they're faithfully executed, can issue orders and proclamations. And sometimes those statutes that Congress passes actually require him to issue a proclamation, let's say a disaster, uh, an emergency declaration that allows a disaster relief. So Congress sometimes requires it, but even when Congress isn't explicit about that, the president can sometimes issue orders. Now, the last thing I wanna mention in my introduction is whether it's good or bad that the president issues these executive orders. Well, that depends on the substance of them. They can be used for good, they can be used for great, they could be used for boring purposes, and they can be used for great mischief. So let me go through a couple of ways we can analyze executive orders. One is whether they're lawful or not. But lawful doesn't mean good. Lawful orders can still be either good or bad. So lawful executive orders can again be boring. Um, I think President uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt set the record. He issued an awful lot of orders during World War II, but that was to win World War II. So most of them were fine. President Truman, uh, who I greatly admire, issued a famous executive order that desegregated uh, the armed forces. And I think not only did he have the power to do so as commander in chief, but I think he was required to do so by the Equal Protection Clause of the Fifth Amendment. But presidents can also issue lawful executive orders that are, constitute terrible policy. Now, the unlawful ones are the ones that we should be especially concerned about. And I'll, I'll talk about President Truman again, because he once issued an executive order that uh, purported to take control or seize American steel mills during a strike during the Korean War. And President Truman thought that the strike might disrupt steel production and hurt the war. Well, he was challenged. It went to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court struck down that executive order saying that even though he was commander in chief of the armed forces, he didn't have authority to seize steel mills and that Congress had to give him that power. So that case has provided a little bit of a framework that we legal types use to analyze executive orders in the future. But the last thing I'll let you know is that doesn't make it a lot easier to evaluate whether something, an executive order is legal or not, you still have to understand the different clauses of the constitution the president claims gives them authority, the different statutes the president claims, and what powers Congress has. And only then can you determine whether an executive order is lawful or not. So with that, I am eager for your questions, grilling, corrections, or whatever. That was amazing, all right. Uh, Evan, we're all going to ask our questions here. I have so maybe kind of lightning round answers so that everybody can have a chance to figure it because I, I, I have, I have, uh, yeah. So I want to talk about Abraham Lincoln, but I think I'm going to come back to that. Okay, I'm going to come back. I'm going to end with Abraham Lincoln. You were mentioning the executive powers that a president has according to the Constitution. Now, in Article One, Section One, Clause One, it just you know it says the executive power shall be vested. It doesn't exactly say he can create orders that overturn duly processed laws necessarily in that, but but that's the, in my opinion, but we can come back to that. That's the first one. The second one that you talked about where he has the power for executive orders is locked in our, is locked into the military. So that I think we could say, okay, that's still steeped that executive order power is still steeped in the, the, the fact that he's commander of chief, but also it has to be checked by Congress because they give the money. 
So there's still a check to that executive power. The, the third one you mentioned is, is he has to execute the laws. Well, in executing the laws, that seems okay to me because the laws have actually been passed by Congress. So it seems like there's a real balance of checks and balances when you're dealing with the military or you're dealing with the execution power of the president to make sure the laws that have been duly passed are, are, are executed, so to speak. So that seems to all kind of work within the checks and balances. I think what worries me the most is when we have executive powers that are not sort of embedded in the checks and balances process, this blatant sort of uh, do this, do that. Um, and that Saturday Night Live skit that we can't play because we didn't think it was totally appropriate for everybody. But so parents and adults look at it before you said it, but I said it best, right? It was just so funny. It's a, it's a Saturday Night Live skit on uh, how to make a bill, a spoof on whatever that show was way back when, somebody tell me what it was, uh, how to make a bill on Capitol Hill. Okay, um, but it really talked about executive orders. I was surprised they did it actually, because it was anti-executive order. So to me, military and executing the laws that had been duly put forth through the legislative branch is an executive power that's okay. Uh, this executive power to kind of blatantly, maybe that one first line that is executive, to, to go and just sort of, make their own decisions. It, it really, really doesn't involve the checks and balances process. I cannot believe that our uh, founders really would have wanted that. So my first real question to you is, after lining all this out, what your thoughts are in these areas, but when it's not embedded in, in, in the actual checks and balances of the legislative branch of the Supreme Court even, um, what, I mean, like, is it legal for a president to come in and overturn a duly elected process law. Now, I could see how the president could come in and overturn what another president's done. So let's say, you know, the executive order. Okay, let me give you an example. Climate change, the, the climate peace accords. Well, that was done kind of not through the checks and balances of the government. That was not checked by the Senate. It, it did not go through, at least they were trying to avoid it. Um, it wasn't, it was more of an executive agreement instead of an executive order. So since it was an executive agreement, it can, it can easily be overturned by the next president. But if it had been duly passed in the way it should have been, or, or if a law is duly passed through the legislative branch, or it's checked through a ratification of the Senate, can a president just come and just overturn something that the people's house has done like that? Your, your questions or your, your statements are great. Generally, no, a president doesn't even pretend that he's overruling laws. Um, it, there's one tiny exception I'll, I'll, I'll mention, but normally what he's president is saying is he's claiming in almost every case that he is executing laws or he's filling in gaps. So let, let's talk about one, two famous executive orders. One executive order is at the beginning of World War II, Franklin Delano Roosevelt ordered 120,000 Japanese and Japanese uh, Americans to go to what came to be known as internment camps for most of the war. Now, no law said that he could do it, but no law said he couldn't do it. And that went to the Supreme Court. So I wonder whether your listeners think that's lawful. Well, it went to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court said lawful. But what's really interesting, and that's an extra check, the Supreme Court was wrong. I think the Supreme Court was scared. I mean, that's kind of a close case. And it took 60 some years later, just three couple years ago for the Supreme Court that said we were wrong. That executive order way back in 1941 was not within Franklin Delano Roosevelt's power. That executive order was unconstitutional. So that's an example of some, sometimes it can be tricky and sometimes our opinions about executive orders change. But to use another example, if the president, um, uh, if Congress passed a law that says uh, Italian troops can't sit in the same barracks as, as black troops and white troops have to be different and, 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 and Truman who issued the executive order that said, no, we are not going to segregate or separate military by race. If someone said, well, the Congress has passed a law saying you must do so, I think the president's executive order would take precedence in that case because there the president is in charge of the military 
and the Constitution also says we shall not discriminate on the basis of race. So sometimes an executive order will trump a law, but in most cases, presidents don't even try. Even when they issue illegal executive orders, they try to claim that it's based on a statute. They try to claim that it's based on the Constitution. They don't claim they can- Okay, well, uh, let, let me ask you a question. And I, I, you, you're the expert, so you can, you can fill in the blanks here. From my understanding, from my understanding, and let's just use this controversial subject here, but the wall, build the building of the wall, and this could maybe apply to the pipeline, but I don't, I don't know about the law. But what I think what I heard was that the wall, the money for the wall had been passed by Congress. It had been approved by Congress and passed by Congress. And so the wall was being built. And then oh, Biden comes in and, and takes that all away with an executive order. I don't know if that applies to the pipeline too. I don't know if the pipeline had been actually passed by Congress. I, I have a hard time. I mean, to me, if it's an executive agreement that was never passed by Congress, and if he wants to overturn that, you can kind of go fine. But if it's passed by Congress, um, and I'm not talking about these really these examples that are so obvious, you know, I'm talking about in, in that people shouldn't be you shouldn't, you know, what Truman did that was judicious. I, I'm, I'm talking about in all these other areas where Congress actually passed it, Congress, it, Congress passed it to, to build the wall, and then he comes in and writes an executive order taking that away. Um, I don't see how that's legal. If Congress did pass. Um, requiring money. I agree with you that that Trump, I mean, uh, that Biden couldn't just override the expenditure of money unless he had some compelling other constitutional argument. But in fact, Congress didn't approve all the money that Trump was using. Trump arguably was pulling money from military budgets and other sorts of things that wasn't specifically directed to the wall. And so that's why President Biden said, for the money that wasn't specifically directed to the wall, I'm stopping it. And here's my executive order stopping what he, he argued was discretionary. Is that what it is? is it, was that what it was? It was specific, not all the money, but specific areas of money? Yes, I believe so. And that's the money okay, that that's Biden stopped. So that's how they get away with it. And do you know about the, the, the pipeline, the Alaskan, the Keystone pipeline, if that had been passed by Congress? I don't think so, but I have to say I'm not sure. I think there, there's, um, there's laws that empower the State Department to, um, to decide on international pipelines, and I think it was that authority that both presidents were interpreting, but I'm a little less clear on that one. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, well I'll let everyone else uh, cover questions. I do have to ask very, very quickly because I want everyone to have their time about Abraham Lincoln. Uh, so two questions about Abraham Lincoln, but I'll just ask them both and let you answer them both. First, so are you saying that his proclamation, um, Emancipation Proclamation was an executive order? Because that's cool. I just wanna know if that's the first thing you, you were saying. And then secondly, I know Truman couldn't shut down, what is it he got in trouble for shutting down during the, oh, the steel, with the steel industry during the Korean War, but didn't Abraham Lincoln take, totally take over the train industry? for government use? Uh, Abraham Lincoln issued a lot of orders that I think were illegal. Um, he suspended habeas corpus, which I think was illegal. He did a lot of things that were illegal, but the Emancipation Proclamation, which is a type of directive, um, uh, was very admirable. And it's interesting, There's I don't have time for the whole history, but it was kind of controversial in his cabinet. And he the reason he didn't, attempt to free the slaves in Maryland were that there was no 14th Amendment and there was no understanding of the Equal Protection Clause at that time. And so he issued the proclamation as a wartime measure. And he, he issued it to the rebelling states. And he said, if you don't stop rebelling, I have the power as a military commander to take those things you're using to engage in rebellion and I am going to free your slaves because you're using the slaves to rebel against 
the government. So that was his theory. And it only applied in those, that's why it only applied in those states that were then in rebellion. It didn't apply in Kentucky and, and Maryland. I think Kentucky, but I know Maryland and um, Delaware. What, what did, the Emancipation Proclamation didn't apply to Maryland. Is that what you're saying? It didn't apply. The 14th Amendment did that freed the slaves, uh -huh. but the 14th Amendment came right. later. Um, so it didn't apply. I think Delaware was a slave state. It only applied in those states that were in rebellion because Lincoln thought he only had power to fight the war and to apply the Pro Emancipation Proclamation to the states that were then in rebellion and those areas uh -huh. of the states that were then in rebellion. That's interesting. So that sounds very legal to me, what he did there. But not an executive order would have been legal too, but it, it seems like he was trying to really steep it in legality there, at least. Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to everybody else. Tova, Tova Love Kaplan, then we'll go to Jorn and uh, Jewel and then Kathy. Sure, so when a president declares a state of emergency, is that considered a form of executive order or is that uh, something different? It, it usually is in the form of an executive order or one of its relatives, what we'll call it a cousin. Sometimes they do it by proclamation, but usually a, a presidency of the United States don't declare states of emergency across everything. They have too many, by the way, Congress has given the president too many powers in my view to declare different emer kinds of emergency. I think Congress should really retract that, restrict it, but sometimes he has, uh, authority to declare a natural emergency in a particular area hit by a hurricane and then give them disaster relief. Or he could declare an economic emergency and impose economic sanctions, or he could change tariff policies. But, but to answer your basic question, yes, a president issues one of these kind of either executive orders or executive proclamations um, to declare a particular type of emergency. Right. So you agree, you think that that is too much, too often um, states of emergency? I think Congress has given too broad authority. We all want a president to be able to declare a natural disaster when that's necessary. But some of the other powers Congress has given the president are too broad and have been abused. Interesting, yeah, I just read an article about how the Trump administration passed a state of emergency for the border wall, which President Biden just rescinded. So that's an interesting, um, argument, but, uh, and then when did the executive order become popular? I was looking at a list of, you know, uh, executive orders by president, and I saw that uh, George Washington did eight throughout all of his eight years, and John Adams did one, and that is, you know, and then you look more modern, and George Bush did uh, 291, and Obama did 276, and Donald Trump did 220, so when did it become such a popular avenue, and, and why did that start happening? Well, some people say it, you know, when government became bigger, and I think it's too big, but when government became bigger, the president had more to manage. And so the president needed to issue more of these. FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, still set the record. And that's because he used them to both respond to the depression, but also to run World War II. So you can, you know, if we're in a world war, you can understand why you might need more orders. If the government's bigger, you might need more orders. But I still think that, to me, what's important is not the absolute number. The absolute number tells you something, but it's how many of them are illegal or unconstitutional. If, if all of them were legal, we maybe shouldn't care about the number, but it's those few that are illegal that we should care about. And how can an executive order be reversed? Can it only be reversed by the following president, or ones that are legal um, specifically? Well, if they're legal, Congress can sometimes pass a law overruling them, but if it's the current president, they may, he may veto it, so they would need two thirds in both houses to override his veto. But, but you can also go to court. Pacific Legal Foundation is in the business of suing in the public interest, and um, other groups can sue. It may take a, a while, um, but sometimes you can overturn an executive order that way. And then what, um, what agency does executive orders have over immigration laws? Um, for example, one thing that comes to mind is early in the Trump presidency, uh, he passed uh, a law banning people from predominantly Muslim countries, banning refugees. And this year he issued a 
ban of green cards uh, for people seeking permanent res residency during the pandemic? Did, you know, what is the, um, what is the rules for president uh, executive orders with regard to immigration laws that, I don't know, may or may not have been passed by Congress? What is the, what is the agency over that? You've picked probably the most controversial area for executive orders. Obama issued uh, one that I think was illegal that DACA, we may like or, or not like his policy, but I don't think he, he said that he didn't have executive authority on his own uh, with just his pen and his phone to prevent the deportation of teenage children. And then he changed his mind and said, I do. And he issued this executive order. So the court, one court in Texas struck it down. It was on appeal to the Supreme Court. Um, and then Trump came into uh, power and Trump just rescinded it. And then it was his, his Trump's uh, uh, executive order rescinding it was challenged and the Supreme Court turned it over saying he didn't use the right procedure. By the way, I disagree with that case too. Um, so the courts can sometimes get it wrong as well. But the immigration area is one of the areas that I think we really want Congress to make the decisions. And Congress does have the primary authority under the constitution over immigration. And it's a shame that, that presidents, um, that uh, uh, presidents try to interfere with what really I think Congress should decide. Okay, and then legally, is it like we're speaking morally, but legally, does the president have the right to like uni unilaterally ban green cards or uh, people from Muslim countries? It depends on on the nature that I wouldn't say exactly how he did it matters, and uh, the. Courts, the Supreme Court actually upheld um, President Trump's second um, ban on the, the, the travel ban, uh, saying that the president had special powers at the border, and presidents traditionally do. Um, but there, I think there were some serious uh, challenges to that one. So uh, it, 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 you, the, there's an expression that you all probably know that devil's in the details. So sometimes a lawyer, we lawyers are trained not to give overly broad answers um, and, until you know the details. Right, um, and then one last question. Um, do you think as Congress gets more and more divided, we see it has very narrow margins and it's kind of hard to push legislation through. Do you think executive orders will be used more and more as kind of another avenue when congressional action doesn't uh, get through as speedily as people want it to? you're very perceptive. It's likely that they'll use more executive orders, but they shouldn't. They're, they're so, so I'll answer your question too. Yes, it's probably more likely, but, but faithful presidents probably still shouldn't, um, to use uh, Obama's phrase, just use their pen and their phone um, and, and try to make policy if Congress can't pass a law. Thank you, Tova. Um, okay, so I do hope someone asks at some point to give us examples of illegal executive orders. I don't even think we've pinpointed that quite yet. Um, but well, maybe you have a little bit with, with the steel industry, but still I'd love some more examples, but don't go there yet. Let's hear what everybody else's questions are. All right, Jewel and Jorn, you're on. Hello, so my, I kind of have a two-part question for you. What in the passing of an executive order, what first brings it to the Supreme Court? You want me to answer that first? Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, we have an adversarial system in the United States, which means that the government doesn't challenge itself. Um, someone uh, who's got an injury, a legal injury, has to file a lawsuit. And again, that's what at Specific Legal Foundation we do for the public interest. Um, so someone has to initiate and the courts have to determine if it's a federal case, they have to determine whether someone has a particularized injury that's different from other people. But, you know, some executive orders have a bigger impact on some people than others. And if they have a bigger impact on some people, and those are the people who can challenge it. Okay. And uh, I know you had talked about the balance of powers. Do you think that an issue that could, that could arise is 
if the Supreme Court is scared to rescind an executive order or deem it unconstitutional, that can be the main player in the passing of illegal executive orders? It certainly can. And I'll go back to the order that Franklin Delano Roosevelt did that caused the rounding up of Japanese and Japanese Americans and putting them in those 10 camps. 120,000 people said that they had to sell their homes and move for, for several years. Do, do you all think that was right? At the time, there was great disagreement. Some people thought the Japanese would engage in, in espionage and, and sabotage if they weren't. But do you, do you think that that was really legal? Well, I think the Supreme Court was scared when it got to the Supreme Court in a case called Kuramatsu and said that the president did the right thing. But 60 some years later, or 70, my math may be wrong, uh, the Supreme Court finally said, yes, we were wrong. And uh, it's only been recent years that they, that they said so. It's great that uh, we're talking about this because when, when we heard the topic and I was thinking about it, I struggle a little bit with understanding executive orders, understanding the legality or the illegality. And for me, it's always come down to understanding our government through rights and through um, really through the rights of the individual and then how best to protect those rights. So I never struggled with certain executive orders being right or wrong, because to me, it would clearly be wrong to round up the Japanese because no matter if the president's commander in chief, he doesn't have the right to violate the rights of free citizens of the United States. Whereas if he were talking about him regulating people coming into the country who are not citizens, they don't have rights granted by the constitution. So he would have freedom to operate in that sphere as commander in chief to protect us. Um, but my understanding of executive orders is somewhat irrelevant and thinking about it as a private citizen and how um, executive orders are, are so inflammatory. When one party is in office, the other party says they're acting like a king. When the other party's in office, they say they're acting like a king. Um, but clearly there has to be truth and we have to be able to get to the truth or else we're all pretty nihilistic here and that would stink. Um, so on that note, we've heard about how the Supreme Court may deem an executive order unconstitutional. Um, what recourse do states have? And possibly the state Supreme Court or individuals, do they have to go only through the United States Federal Supreme Court? Well, first I'll, I'll try to comment that your opinion does matter and you have a very impressive analysis. So I know you're a very creative person, um, but I think you should go to law school at night um, because your <laughs> insights are, are wonderful because it's the individual rights that we particularly care about most of Pacific Legal Foundation. And, and that's why we, we will challenge, we challenge all presidents on behalf of individual rights. We, you know, we, I like most of, of Trump's executive orders and actually helped promote four of them that Biden has since repealed. And I'm upset that Biden repealed them, um, but uh, we still need to sue um, all presidents, whether they're Republican, Democrat, anything, we, we are in favor of individual rights. So to your specific question, states can sometimes be specially hurt by illegal federal uh, statutes or illegal federal executive orders. And the states were the ones who sued Obama over the immigration executive order that I thought the president didn't have power to. So states have some other influence. They can try to get their members of Congress to act. They usually have uh, you know, a big pulpit and they can um, you know, scream and yell and cry. And sometimes that actually makes a difference, um, but they can sue like the rest of us uh, if they are particularly harmed and, and they often are. And then do you think that the, that in the modern, in the modern uh, mod, uh, modus operandi of executive orders, do you think that there would need to be some further codification, whether I guess it would need to be an amendment because it's truly the presidential powers. 
but do you see the system of checks and balances correcting um, what we have happening today when when the executive orders are flying so fast and and some of them i mean of course it'd be going right to the most controversial but there is one related to uh men and women's sports and and the your opinion on what that is um it'd be hard to find a case for the president to have authority over that but that being said should we and, and really asking you here, should we still have faith in the system as it's set up or should we look to needing to specify it more clearly in an amendment or some other process? Well, I, I think I'll, I'll try to answer your last part first. We ought, to, we ought to have faith in the system. We should have faith in the system. It's not as much as, as I'm disappointed by it. Um, I think it's still one of the best systems in the world, if not the best, but what else do we have? So uh, what we need to do is just, there, there are ways in which all three of the branches have disappointed me. And I'm also director of our Center for the Separation of Powers. I want all three branches to start acting more like they should to protect our individual interests. The president ought not to be trying to exercise power he doesn't have, but I'm more disappointed by Congress. Congress has been kind of, weak in, in, in recent decades, in my view, and they need to assert their power and, and also just not act tribally, like Republicans always defending Republican presidents and Democrats always defending Democratic presidents. The framers expected ambition to challenge ambition. And by that, they thought that Congress and the president would uh, be at loggerheads with each other. Um, and then the courts need to do a better job of enforcing uh, the separation of powers. Um, the courts have been stepping up in some ways uh, in recent years, but they're still, they still have a ways to go to enforce the proper, the proper lines. And what we need to do is elect presidents who act honestly, insist that members of Congress we elect uh, assert themselves, um, and unless we do so, then the politicians may take the path of least resistance and, you know, aggrandize their own power, which means they, they assume more and more power and exercise more and more power by themselves. Thank you very much. Well, Jill and Joran, great questions. Um, yeah. Janine, you want me to go ahead and jump in? We got so many wonderful yeah, audience yeah. questions as well. I was just, I'm sure the audience has a lot of great questions. Yes, go ahead. Well, first of all, uh, Kay Bailey asks, is it legal to tell the executive branch to ignore a law passed by the legislature? In other words, to not enforce a law? Well, it depends on who is trying to tell the president not to enforce a law, but the president has an obligation to take care that all the laws are faithfully executed. So his obligation under the constitution is to take care that all laws are executed regardless of what someone instructs. If Congress actually passes a law amending another law, well then they, they change the law. Um, uh, and, and Congress is certainly free to do so, uh, but until it actually enacts a law, the president is, is required to follow it. But the last thing I'll say on that is every law, some Congress passes vague and broad laws that are too broad. And that's what also allows mischief. So that's another problem. Congress passes a law to like do something about clean air and they pass a law that gives the president too much discretion. So Congress should be more careful in the details of the laws it passes. And then the president would have less wiggle room to try to uh, fill in the gaps and abuse his power. So in speaking- Yeah, I'll just step in there, Kathy. Go ahead. Kathy, real quick. That, that's why I think the bills need to be smaller because if the bills are smaller, they'd be more specific. So I'm just gonna toss that out there. Anyway, go ahead, Kathy. Well, speaking of Congress, uh, Professor Klinger uh, asked, makes a statement really, but I think it's, it's interesting. He says the word all does not appear in the language vesting executive power in the president in article two. The word all does appear in the vesting clause for legislative powers in article one. 
And Professor Klinger goes on to say, where I worry about executive orders is when they seem to depart from or exceed laws enacted by Congress. Well, that is the right area to, to be concerned about. And the professor is certainly right that the word all is missing in the vesting of executive power in the president. But there's still a lot of questions about what the executive power the president has. And um, it's a combination. The executive power the president has is a combination of the constitutional powers he's clearly been asked to take care of and all the powers that Congress has given him by statute. And uh, back to Janine's uh, point, if Congress would write more specific laws and take more responsibility, um, I think that would alleviate a lot of the problems. And then Robert Zimmerman, who I just, I wanna give a shout out to, cause, cause Robert had actually suggested the topic for this show. So thank you, Mr. Zimmerman. But Robert Zimmerman asks, what recent executive orders is your group now challenging? And similarly, Jerry Kohler is asking, uh, President Biden has signed a lot of executive orders in his first few months as president. Are any of his orders being challenged? And if so, how? Well, um, thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, by my last count, the, uh, mm -hmm. President Biden has um, issued 37 executive orders. He has mm -hmm. repealed 37 of Trump's executive orders in full and two and in part. In some of his executive orders, he's done other things, but in one executive order, he repealed five of Biden's executive orders. So that's why the count is a little bit off. Um, a lot of them are just telling the executive branch agencies to study a bunch of regulations and decide later whether to repeal them or not. So they're not the final action and they probably aren't a good vehicle for us to challenge. Um, there are others that I'm very disappointed in, but I think are legal. And so we wouldn't challenge those. Those Biden executive orders that repealed Trump's regulatory reform executive orders are probably lawful, but it's a little unclear what he means by that. I'll, I'll just give one example. President Trump issued an executive order requiring agencies to post all the guidance documents on agency websites if they affect the public. And so the agencies were putting all these guidance documents on the website. And then Biden, President Biden comes in and he repeals that. And the agencies are removing all their guidance documents from the website. Oh, I don't know why Biden didn't want those guidance documents up there. It was a great thing that Trump said that, that agencies should post their guidance documents. Does that mean that Biden's for secret guidance documents? Does that mean he, he's going to issue a new one? We don't know quite yet. We don't know quite yet whether um, the the president is going to come up with, the new president is going to come up with his own executive order. Presidents sometimes replace one executive order with their own. And I wish that President Biden had done that. Um, but in some cases, I think he just wants to wipe out some of President Trump's accomplishments. And back to one other question that we had talked about a, a few minutes ago, the, the XL pipeline. Uh, Robert Zimmerman also asks, what about voiding existing contracts between countries with the XL pipeline? Um, is that something that, that presidents can do via executive order? Um, sometimes the executive order, and I think this might be the case, the executive order instructs a lower level secretary or agency head to take the next step. And then the lower level agency head takes the next step. And if that's the case, then the dispute is between the agency head. And I think that might've been done in the XL pipeline, although I confess I'm, I, I haven't studied that carefully and I'm not clear. But one thing is, is if a government um, voids a contract, it might be able to do that, but sometimes damages still might be due. Um, if the government, takes your property, for example, for a public use. And we've taken several cases to the Supreme Court on that. And we, one of my colleagues is gonna argue in the Supreme Court just next Monday 
on a case that involves this clause of the Fifth Amendment. The government can take your property if it's for a public use, but then it has to pay you compensation. So sometimes the fight is over, can the government do this or not? Sometimes the fight is over, okay, the government can do this, but it owes me compensation. And that's the, we've now had a couple of cases like that in the Supreme Court, and we're trying to expand the instances when the government must pay us compensation when it takes our property. And then we we also have a, one of our listeners is, is uh, emailing in a question. Uh, Dwayne Horner is asking about when the president uh, in, in Vietnam and Korea, we never had a declaration of war in in those uh, in those wars. Was that a type of executive order or is that overstepping uh, presidential authority? Um, what about in, with wars? Um, the war power is shared between Congress and the president. And, and it's an interesting area. Uh, Professor John Yu of Berkeley Law School has written some, some very good books on this. And um, it's unclear, the, the Congress has the exclusive power to declare war, but does the president have power to repel an invasion if Congress hasn't acted? I mean, that's, a, that's an example. Or does the president have the power to, um, let's say one of our Navy ships was attacked. Could the president order that Navy ship to fire back before Congress declares war? So there's some instances in which the president has the power to engage in hostilities um, short of a declaration of war. Um, but during those undeclared wars, uh, by the way, most people think that Vietnam War and Korean War, they went on too long and Congress should have, have declared war, but Congress continued to fund those wars. So another argument that Professor John Yu, a great conservative scholar, from University of Berkeley, even though he's at University of Berkeley, he's a great conservative, um, uh, argues is that Congress has the power to cut off funds. And if Congress is providing uh, funds for war, it's effectively authorizing the war. Um, Janine, would you like, do you, do you want me to? Go back to you or just keep asking a few more audience questions. Um, well, I know we only have about three minutes left. Well, I, I think my first question, I'm still kind of unsettled on some, some topics. One would be if you can actually provide an executive order that affects agreements with that we've made with other states. And you said that that would go to a subcommittee, you know, a sub, you know, down the something, whoever was in charge, but that didn't really answer whether even it doesn't matter if the president's negotiating that or if someone in a specific department's negotiating that, it's still canceling out the, the agreement. So are they, is that legal? When you talk about international um, agreements, usually the president has the authority to cancel them, but there still might be, as I said, damages. There might be damages to the company. There might be there's certainly damage to our international relations with Canada. If Canada wanted the contract. Um, but generally we say a president has authority to cancel international. Presidents can, here, here's another tricky thing that the Supreme Court hasn't made absolutely clear. To create a treaty, you need um, the president to sign it and two thirds of the Senate to ratify it. But it's generally thought that a president can abrogate is the fancy legal term, but that means end, end a treaty on his own. And maybe that's because the treaty, let's say we, we have a, a treaty with uh, Japan, we didn't, but let's say we had a treaty with Japan before Pearl Harbor and Pearl Harbor uh, a treaty of, of support and defense, and Japan bombs Pearl Harbor. The president can end that treaty like that. At least that's, that's the understanding. So generally when we're talking about international relations, the president has authority to stop most things, probably not, or I shouldn't say everything, 
but to, to end a lot of things like that, but there still may be consequences. Hmm. But that's yeah, a special, that has... you, you, you've, you've identified a special area. Um, there are many other areas where the president doesn't have as broad authority. And those are the ones going back to, um, I think it was Jules' question, where they affect domestic um, uh, individual rights. And, and I think that um, uh, uh, Tova also raised the question about there's a difference between how people in our country are treated and whether you can um, ban other people in other countries uh, from coming to America. So there, there is often a distinction between the powers that apply to those of us who are citizens in America and uh, to foreigners. Foreigners don't have the same um, rights as we do to challenge a presidential decision. Yeah, well, that came up in, in, in Guantanamo Bay, you know, you know, and with terrorists or with, with from overseas, do they have the right? That's a that's the show in itself. <laughs> that's a show in itself. Does a terrorist from abroad who comes over here have the right to a trial? I mean, you know, I, there are a lot of people who think no, they're not American citizens based on just what you said, and other people say, well, America. We do everything by the law, but if, if you're not an American citizen, that I would really, really love to have Thomas Jefferson and George Washington and John Adams and and all right here to ask them if, what their intention was. If foreigners are coming to attack America, have the right to due process. I, I would really be intrigued about their answer. And we are out of time. Um, you can tell me your answer very quickly if you think a foreigner who comes over and creates terror in America and kills Americans has right to a free trial in America if they're not American citizens. Uh, it depends, depends on where they are at the time. If, if we capture them overseas, I don't think they have the right. But if un, whether, whether you agree or not, if they're on American soil, that may give them or probably does give them the right uh, to a trial. Um, but uh, 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 but they also it's possible that they could be held as a enemy combatant under military law. So unfortunately, the lawyer Which is what says there's no there's no simple answer. Yeah, I know. I, I th well, thank you. This has been so terrific, and and I find that when I it's interesting because we we do a lot of these. I we I I don't know how many we've done, Kathy. 70, 80. And uh, lawyers, it's, it's really fascinating because philosophers, you know, um, our politicians are very distinct in their opinions and their views and uh, philosophers will still look at both sides. And kind of, I, I'm more of a philosopher, you know, kind of think things through. But uh, lawyers are not so black and white, I'm finding. Lawyers are, and you can't be, I guess, because you have to study both sides of an argument and there's so many variations. There's really not a lot of black and white in law, is there? I mean, it, it seems like there would be, but with precedence and everything that's happened in the past, it seems like there's a lot more gray than there is black and white. Yes, I think that's what we've learned today. We can't just say all executive orders are bad or, you know, because there's so many variants to them all. Would you say that's true, Todd? A absolutely. And, uh, uh, but I hope that, everyone on your panel and all your listeners have a better understanding of them now and can can better evaluate them on their own we do we do thank you so much it's a, it's a real much. treat for us to have, some, to have someone with your uh, your stat of your stature on our show to teach us about this today jewel and jordan i stepped over your thank you go ahead no problem thank you very much it was a great show it's our third one. So um, thank you for being in. Uh, we've already learned an incredible amount. It was a real pleasure to work with someone that could uh, easily answer our questions as well and uh, deepen our wealth of knowledge. You learn something. As you have. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Kathy, you want to say? In Yes, thank you so much, Todd. And thank you to everybody who was with us today and, and everyone who gave us such great questions. And thank you to our sponsors, Paul and Barbara Claffey, who've really been supporting Constituting America since day one. So we thank y'all and, and for all you do for our auctions and, and all the different ways that, that you're involved in our programming. Yes, thank you so much, Paul and Barbara. And Todd, once again, thank you, thank you. My daughter's going to law school too. 
she's starting next year. So um, I'm going to have a lawyer in the family. <laughs> First one. Very in our good. Family, actually. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Jeanette. Jeanette, you want to give a brief shout out? Todd, if you need to go, you're cool. To, but we don't want to keep you up. But uh, thank you, Todd. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jeanette, Hi. do you want to talk about book, book and a speech very quickly? Sure. Just go to constitutingamerica.org and click on the book of speech page. Remember that there is never a fee. We do this as part of our mission to bring the message of the Constitution to your school, troop, youth group, whoever needs to hear it. So we hope to hear from you soon. Yes, we have so many booked the next couple of weeks, don't we, Jeanette? Jeanette, and Jeanette yes, I give those do. speeches. All right, Aubrey. Also, join us if you're still with us right now. Join us for the next four episodes. The next four or five is going to be on natural law. Um, God-given rights, natural law. It's going to be a fabulous, most intriguing uh, next series. So that starts next Tuesday. Natural law, you know, are we going to be a country based on founding principles with God and is our creator or not? So Jill and Jordan, that'll be a good one, right? And Aubrey, say goodbye. Thank you so much, Aubrey. Yes, thank you. All right. See you, everybody. See you next, next Tuesday. Thank you. Thank you.